This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Well, good evening, Tampa Bay, and welcome to your source for all the news about worms and germs. My name is Robert, and I appreciate you listening. And I want to start off today's show with, you know, something that a lot of you may have already heard about, but it's a sad and a tragic story um, out of uh, Orlando area. And uh, there was a boy, a six-year-old boy, um, named uh, Riker Roke, and uh, he died from rabies. You know, that's a pretty rare thing in the United States, but uh, it tragically did happen. And the story that led up to it kind of went like this, according to an NBC report. Apparently the dad found a, a sick bat in the backyard. And he says, I found a bat. I put it in a little bucket, put it on the porch and asked my son, don't touch it under any circumstances. Uh, but unfortunately the, the boy, the six year old boy put his hand in there and touched it and then said he got scratched by the bat. And so the dad went ahead and Googled, you know, what should I do? And uh, uh, he ended up washing his hands with soap and water for five minutes, which is the right start. And um, however, instead of taking to the boy to the 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 doctor, the health department, or the or the emergency room to get um, post exposure prophylaxis for rabies, which is what will save your life. Um, they didn't do it, um, because they were afraid that the, ba- uh, the child, um, he was crying, uh, just thinking about getting shots. Well, that didn't work out so well. About a week later, the boy started complaining of numbness in his fingers and a headache and he was taken to the, uh, to the hospital and the doctors became really alarmed when they heard about the bat scratch and, uh, they went ahead and tried uh, a experimental procedure called the Milwaukee Protocol, and you'll hear about this in this interview I have today. <clears throat> but unfortunately, it didn't pan out, and the boy did die earlier uh, this week. Yeah, very, very sad story. So I did an interview with a, a gentleman named Peter Costa. He's a rabies expert, and we go over rabies general rabies information and, and the really important stuff, you know, what should you do if you are exposed to rabies? So, uh, Mike, let's go ahead and play that interview. So what is rabies and what should you do if you're exposed? Well, joining me now to answer these questions and many more is Peter J. Costa, MPH. Uh, Pete is the Rabies Immune Globulin Brand Director with Kedrian Biopharma. Uh, Peter has a graduate degree in public health and is an honorary member of the American Veterinary Epidemiology Society. In in addition to his work with Kedrion, he also sits on the Rabies in the Americas Steering Committee, and he serves as a reviewer for the journal PLOS, Neglected Tropical Diseases. Hi, Pete, and welcome to the show. Hi, Robert. Hey, thanks for having me. You bet. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, some very sad and tragic news from the Orlando area this week. Um, Let's look at some things about rabies uh, the listening audience would benefit from. And let's start out with some of the basics. Pete, what is rabies and how do you get it? Yeah, thanks, Robert. So, um, you know, rabies is really a a fascinating disease. Um, You know, rabies is a a deadly but preventable disease uh, that infects the brain. It's a very old uh, viral disease of mammals, right? So this is a disease that's maintained in the animal population um, and is most often transmitted to humans through the bite of a rabid animal uh, and most often through the saliva. So when our skin is broken, for example, uh, by, a scra- by a bite or a scratch from a rabid animal, rabies-infected saliva can enter our bodies and start to cause the disease process. So the virus enters at the bite site, uh, travels along the nerves to the brain, uh, where it causes massive uh, viral infection. Um, and then from the brain, 
the virus travels back out to the various body organs, uh, including the salivary glands, where it's able to be injected into another animal or, or a human uh, when a bite occurs. So it's, it's most important to remember that rabies is preventable but not curable, uh, and if left untreated, uh, rabies is nearly always fatal. Right. Now, you mentioned it's a disease of mammals. Um, Pete, what type of animals or mammals are considered high risk for having the virus? Sure, yeah. So throughout the continental United States, wild animals such as, uh, you know, like raccoons, skunks, foxes, and bats are the major reservoirs for rabies. Now, uh, in Puerto Rico, the mongoose uh, is the primary vector. Uh, but around the world, and particularly in resource-poor nations throughout Asia and Africa, uh, you know, dogs still remain the single most important reservoir for rabies. Now, the main source of human rabies in the United States is from bats. And now, not not all bats have rabies, uh, but it's it's very important that everyone, uh, especially children and parents, are aware of the risk of rabies transmission from bats. Um, you know, bat bites can be very small, and some people may not realize that they've been bitten, uh, or they may even minimize the severity of the exposure. And that in the in the bat's teeth are just so small, it's like a needle. So right, they may not even recognize that they've been bitten. Um, Pete, uh, we have this um, typical appearance that we see in a rabbit animal. But the, can you describe that? But and also, does that always occur? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Really, very interesting. And um, you know, we, there's a couple of different manifestations, right? So, um, so you know, rabies in animals usually first manifests with a change in behavior, and you know, that, that's confusing, right? I mean, there's many conditions that'll cause an animal to change behavior, but you know, what's important to note with rabies is that it's a progressive disease. So, um, the animal will only get worse until it dies. Some animals will, um, they may stop eating or drinking. Um, other animals may just want to be left alone. Uh, oftentimes, animals might appear agitated. Um, they may even be chewing at the site uh, where they were bitten, for example. Um, with wildlife, um, you know, they may show no fear of humans. Uh, bats, for example, uh, specifically may exhibit uh, unusual behavior um, like daytime activity or um, an inability to fly or fluttering around on the ground. On the ground. Um, and sometimes even making unusual sounds like hissing uh, and expanding their wings. Now, as the rabies disease progresses, um, animals may appear aggressive um, or overly docile. Um, now, the, the the furious form of the disease, disease is uh, what we all conjure up in our minds, you know, as we think about uh, Cujo or the animal that's growling at us, baring its teeth and foaming at the mouth, right? Right. Um, now, these animals may be uh, more likely to bite other animals, uh, humans, and, and even inanimate objects. Now, other animals may exhibit the more docile or uh, paralytic behavior of the disease, uh, where they may be weak, uh, difficult to wake up, uh, or, have an, or have a loss of coordination when they're walking, maybe look like they're kind of stumbling around and maybe even fall down. Um, and I've seen both manifestations of the virus, uh, and they're, they're equally troubling. Right. Now, what type of symptoms would you uh, see in a human uh, that has rabies? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, so first and foremost, I, I want to say that if, if, you know, if you think that you've been bitten by uh, or exposed to a rabid animal, uh, it's very important to get medical attention as soon as possible right. uh, because, you know, rabies is almost always fatal. And once symptoms appear, uh, you know, we know medical intervention is, is re rarely successful. So part of the reason why immediate medical attention is so important is because, uh, you know, ra rabies has a highly variable incubation period. And so that's the time, uh, you know, that it takes for the virus to move from the uh, the site of the inoculation, you know, like the site of the bite, uh, to when symptoms begin to appear. Now, uh, the incubation period for rabies is usually one to three months, but it can be as short as a few days. And so uh, because of this, it's important to receive prompt and proper medical attention right away. So 
Some of the first signs of rabies in humans are really very nonspecific, and they may even seem, um, you know, flu-like. You may have a headache, a fever, uh, just general aches and pains. Um, however, after a couple of days, you know, the disease will progress to what's called the acute neurologic phase, and this phase includes many of the um, hallmark or, you know, like the classic signs and symptoms we've heard about through the ages. So this is uh, things like hallucinations, hydrophobia, aerophobia, uh, tingling at the site uh, where you were bitten at, and trouble sleeping. But shortly thereafter, um, patients then begin to have uh, heart problems and trouble breathing and then progress into a coma and paralysis and death and uh, really very nasty. All of this happens over a short course of about 14 days. And so, um, you know, prevention of exposure and prevention of disease before clinical signs is what it's really all about. Uh, because if you st if you start showing signs of illness, it's it's too late. Right, and and we're going to get into the prevention in a little bit. Um, now, something that's been in uh, caught a lot of attention recently because of the Orlando case and because of a case in Brazil about a week before that is this experimental procedure called the Milwaukee Protocol. Um, Pete, can you go ahead and explain to the audience or summarize what this is? Yeah, you know, um, you know, all deaths um, for rabies are, are, are needless deaths. The death of young Riker uh, um, in Florida is just absolutely tragic. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, on behalf of, of Kedron Biopharm, my heart goes out to the family. Uh, I myself have small children about his age and um, cannot begin to imagine the pain and grief that the Roke family is going through at this time. No doubt. Mm -hmm. So um, our, our hearts and prayers certainly go out go out to his family. The, um, the Milwaukee Protocol is, is an experimental procedure, uh, as you pointed out. It, it, it was developed by a pediatrician um, and infectious disease specialist named uh, Dr. Rodney Willoughby. Now, the goal of the procedure is to save the life of someone who's begun to show clinical signs of rabies. Um, the process uh, generally includes putting a, the patient into an induced coma. Uh, really to protect their brain from the virus uh, while simultaneously administering antivirals. And so um, uh, in 2000, September 2004, the, the protocol was attempted on a teenager named Gina Giese, now uh, Gina Frasetto in Wisconsin. And uh, she was bitten when trying to pick up a bat. Now, after treating the bite locally, the her family or parents had decided not to seek medical attention, and so, you know, Gina did not receive post-exposure prophylaxis. And about, one, uh, about a month after the bat bite, Gina became symptomatic, um, and when she didn't respond to treatment and was testing negative for other illnesses and diseases, you know, she had reminded her parents um, and the doctors about her bat bite. Uh, so, you know, she was diagnosed with rabies and was transferred to Children's Hospital of, of Wisconsin, where, where Dr. Willoughby devised this experimental treatment to try to save, uh, try to save um, Gina. So Gina was uh, in a coma for about a week. Um, she remained in isolation at the hospital for, I think, over a month um, until she was declared uh, virus-free. She ultimately survived, and uh, although she had a hard road to recovery, um, I am happy to say she has since made a, a nearly complete recovery. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, this is not to say that waiting until symptoms appear is okay. Uh, or that the Milwaukee Protocol is the fix-all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, you know, it has been attempted many times, uh, but there are very few survivors. Uh, and for those who have survived, there's disagreement within the medical community. You know, medical experts disagree as to the how and the why, um, and hypothesize that uh, you know perhaps maybe it's due to some common genetic factor. All right. Well, so, yeah. let, let's go ahead and um, really get into the uh, really important part of this interview, and that's the post-exposure prophylaxis. And uh, this is so mm -hmm. key. Um, Pete, what should somebody do if they're bitten or scratched by an animal and possibly exposed to rabies? What's what's the steps one, two, three, or, or however you can put it? Yeah, perfect. So thank you. Very important, very um, very timely question. So, uh, you know, again, I, I cannot stress enough that rabies is preventable but not curable. Um, so if you've been bitten by an animal or, or suspect that you've been exposed to rabies, um, you should immediately and, and thoroughly clean all wounds with soap and water. All right, you would, just like you would with any, with any wound, right, you'd clean with soap and water. You'd then seek medical attention right away. 
um, by contacting your medical care provider uh, or going straight to your local emergency room. Um, and then if it's determined that you were possibly exposed to rabies, you'll receive rabies immune globulin uh, and a series of vaccinations. And so, in addition, all, all animal bites should, should really be reported to your local health authority um, or your animal control office. So I think what the, uh, certainly the audience needs to know is that rabies is a medical urgency and that you know, they should not delay seeking medical care if they suspect they've been exposed to rabies. Right. Now, you mentioned two different types of uh, shots, and uh, the rabies immune globulin and the rabies vaccine. Pete, can you explain the difference for the audience between these two things? Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question. We have found there's um, there's a good deal of confusion around this subject, uh, and it's super important that people you know really understand the difference. So, uh, you know, rabies immune globulin and rabies vaccines um, are actually very different in terms of their role in preventing rabies. So, you know, in short, uh, you know, rabies immune globulin is administered once uh, and begins to work immediately while the rabies vaccine takes 7 to 10 days to work and is administered through a series of shots. However, um, they're both given in combination and they work together. So let me, let me elaborate on this a little bit. So, um, so previously we spoke about um, the, you know, this highly variable incubation period for rabies and uh, you know, kind of a limited window of opportunity um, for us to treat patients exposed to the rabies virus. Now, the, the goal of rabies post-exposure prophylaxis is to um, interrupt the path of the virus, right, to, to stop it from ever reaching the central nervous system uh, by introducing um, what's called rabies virus neutralizing antibodies. Now, there's, there's two ways in which we do this. One is rabies immune globulin, and the other is through the rabies vaccine. Now, however, like most vaccines, rabies vaccines take time to work. In fact, it can take our bodies seven to ten days to respond to the rabies vaccine uh, and to begin uh, producing these neutralizing antibodies on our own. However, with rabies immune globulin, rabies virus neutralizing antibodies are delivered immediately uh, and provide immediate protection against the virus during this time it's taking uh, for the vaccine to start start to work. So to some extent, you could say that um, rabies immune globulin is, is fast acting and short lasting, while rabies vaccine is slow acting, uh, but long lasting. Um, another difference is the dosage and administration of these products. Um, rabies immune globulin is dosed by body weight. So the more a person weighs, uh, the more immune globulin they'll require. And um, rabies immune globulin is also only only administered one time uh, at the beginning of rabies post-exposure prophylaxis, whereas uh, rabies vaccine uh, is the same dose regardless of your body weight, uh, but is given multiple times in a series of uh, four or five shots over a course of, of 14 to 28 days. Uh, also, rabies immune globulin is uh, infiltrated into and around the bite site. Now, uh, the reason for this is to provide immediate access to rabies virus neutralizing antibodies right at the inoculation point. Now again, this differs from rabies vaccine, right, which is typically administered in a deltoid area um, or in younger children, the outer aspect of the thigh. Um, however, it's important to note that uh, even if a bite site is not known, uh, for example, if someone wakes up and they find a bat in their room and they don't know if they've been bitten or exposed, human rabies immune globulin is still indicated for post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, and in this case, um, rabies immune globulin is um, administered via the intramuscular route, you know, and just put simply at an a anatomical site distant um, from the rabies vaccine. You know, so, so overall, two different procedures administered concurrently that work in combination um, to provide r complete protection against the deadly rabies virus. Right. So that's really important for people to know these different steps. Uh, if you do get a bite, um, because as Pete has said many times that this is a preventable disease. Um, Pete, what else can be done to protect family and pets and the like? Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is important, right? So, so there's lots of things, really. So first of all, um, you know, you, you can protect yourself from rabies by uh, vaccinating, vaccinating any household pets. You know, there's uh, just a ton of households across the U.S. that have pets. 
And um, so by vaccinating our household pets, uh, avoiding contact with stray animals and wildlife, uh, and seeking prompt medical care if you're exposed. You know, a, a good rule of thumb, Robert, is uh, what I always say is, you know, love your own animals, leave others alone. Mm -hmm. um, it's also important to keep in mind that our, our pets are our firewall, really, between, you know, what's lurking in our backyard and what enters our homes. Uh, and, you know, also protecting our pets through um, routine rabies vaccination is not only the law in most states, um, but it's an important part of responsible pet ownership. So, um, you know, some, some key pointers, um, I would say, you know, no feeding, uh, no touching or, or adopting wild animals or, or stray dogs and cats, um, certainly keeping our pets up to date on their rabies vaccinations. And, you know, people, people can consult with their veterinarians about when their pet needs to be vaccinated. Um, you know, not allowing our pets to roam free. Uh, and, and doing what we can to not attract wild animals to our homes, right? So, for example, um, you know, I have a bird feeder. I'm sure other people do as well. You know, for, you know, storing bird seed uh, or, or other animal feed in containers uh, that have tight, you know, tight-fitting lids, um, feeding our pets indoors, and, you know, usual things like making sure our garbage cans are, are, are tight, tightly capped. Um, Openings in our attic, you know, it's important to board up any openings we might have in our attic, in our basements, um, in our porch, or even in our garages, um, and to cap chimneys. You know, we can we can cap chimneys with screens. Um, I think really important is that we encourage children uh, to immediately tell an adult if they're bitten or scratched. Um, so if, if a child is bitten or scratched by an animal, you know, um, we need to be teaching our children uh, not to approach uh, or to touch uh, any animal they don't know. Um, you know, and, and finally, like I've said before, you know, it's vital that all animal bites are reported um, to whatever the local health authority might be, the local health department, um, or even a local animal control office. I think those are um, smart pointers that can uh, we can we use to protect ourselves and our pets. Well, great advice. Now, lastly, Pete, um, just to piggyback on the rabies immune globulin, um, Kedrion Biopharma recently received FDA approval for Kedrab, um, this new uh, immune globulin, which should be on the market pretty soon. Uh, can you talk at all about this new product? Sure. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So um, Kedrab was approved uh, by the FDA. Uh, on August 23rd, 2017, and uh, represents the um, first product that Kedron Biopharma uh, will have played a role in bringing, um, you know, from the clinical research stage all the way through to sales and distribution. So, you know, we're, we're really very excited about this new human rabies immune globulin and expect it to be available on the market uh, in the coming weeks. So, um, as you rightly mentioned, Kedrab is a human rabies immune globulin. It's, it's indicated for post-exposure prophylaxis of rabies infection. And um, I went ahead and, you know, forwarded you the, the full prescribing information and certainly invite you to refer to that um, for more details. Uh, but what I can tell you is that Kedrab works by providing immediate rabies virus neutralizing antibody protection. Uh, until, again, like we talked about, until a patient's immune system responds to the rabies vaccine. Um, and as I've mentioned throughout our discussion, you know, human rabies immune globulin, such as Kedrab, is a, is a crucial part of rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, in addition um, to our new rabies product, uh, Kedrion Biopharma fully intends uh, to become a leader in rabies education um, and really seeks to build trusted and lasting relationships uh, with, within, um, you know, throughout the rabies prevention community. All right. Well, excellent stuff. I want to thank you, Pete Costa, for your time and expertise and this valuable, valuable information. Thanks a lot, Robert. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you, sir. Well, just sticking with the uh, rabies theme in the first half, uh, there was another story that came out about a week before the tragic Orlando case, and that was a, a boy from Brazil. And him and his two siblings were bitten by vampire bats. And they all contracted rabies. Uh, his two siblings died. But he was given the Milwaukee Protocol, which you just heard Peter talk about. And um, he survived it. And he's one of the few. And uh, so that was a pretty amazing story out of Brazil. Um, and uh, just to keep you up to date, uh, 
on the website. I encourage you to check it out. That's OutbreakNewsToday.com, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Follow us on Facebook at Infectious Disease News. And my Twitter page is BackDman63. Okay, well, after the break, we're going to talk a little bit about the flu season right now in Florida and uh, some other uh, news that's going on around the country. So I'll see you then. Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, welcome back to the show. Feeling a little bit under the weather uh, this evening as I record the show, but um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one. And the CDC is telling us that uh, it's a pretty brutal flu season so far. It's starting early. And uh, I believe as of today, 49 out of the 50 states are really seeing some increases in flu activity. Now, right here in Florida, uh, the state health department is telling us that the flu activity is high and it's continuing to increase. Um, And they're seeing increases in all regions of the state. And in particularly up around the panhandle, the Pensacola area is uh, getting hit the hardest. Uh, They're saying that visits to emergency rooms among pregnant women and adults over 65 years of age continue to increase sharply and remain well above peak activity observed during previous seasons. And this is important because these groups are at a very high risk for complications from influenza infection. Uh, Just in the last week alone, there's been 34 flu outbreaks reported in the state. And since the flu season started, um, it's been well over 100. And Florida Department of Health says there's been more outbreaks reported at this time than in previous seasons at the same time. So, yeah, we're having a, a, a really rough flu season, and, and hopefully that's not what you're, I'm feeling in my voice. Uh, right now they're saying just about all of them, about 9 out of 10 of the outbreaks have been linked to facilities, this is bad news, that have been serving people at higher risk for complications due to influenza activity. So facilities that are dealing with young children and adults 65 and older. Um, And the Florida Department of Health continues to recommend that sick people stay home until they're fever-free for at least 24 hours, and that all people exercise good hand-washing practices. And if you haven't been vaccinated, get vaccinated. Um, Even though the percentage of, you know, its effectiveness is you know, the CDC said the other day it's about 30%. I know Australia said it's about 10%, but <coughs> here they're saying it's about 30%. Even if you do get the flu, it may minimize the symptoms. Because if you've ever been hit with flu head on, you're, you're talking about five days in bed. So you want to avoid that. And they're also saying, you know, uh, the CDC is recommending the use of uh, the antivirals, like, like Tamiflu and Valenza. Um, as soon as possible, especially for those that are hospitalized or severely ill. Uh, and of course, you got to give this drug within 48 hours of symptoms for it to be truly effective. And in our local um, Tampa Bay Times, uh, Dr. Allison Simpson, she's a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Florida Hospital in Tampa, said, You know, adults 65 and older and children are most at risk for severe complications from flu. It's so important for kids to get the flu shot. And since children, and this is important, since children under six months cannot get a flu shot, any adult who is handling young children needs to get immunized. It's really easy to pass the flu onto a baby that they're watching. So So that's my uh, flu update for, uh, for this week. And, uh, Hope everybody takes heed. <coughs> um, then staying on the on the flu theme here, uh, it was interesting. We saw a study um, from researchers at the University of Maryland, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that said uh, 
flu can be spread just by breathing and it's not necessarily you require coughing and sneezing. And uh, it's easier to spread the influenza virus than previously thought, according to these researchers. People commonly believe that they can catch the flu by exposure to droplets from an infected person's cough or sneeze or by touching contaminated surfaces. But they're saying that new information that they discovered shows that flu transmission can be passed from one person to another just by breathing. And uh, Dr. Donald Milton, he's a professor of environmental health at the University of Maryland School of Public Health, and he was the lead researcher on the study, said, quote, we found that the flu cases contaminated the air around them with infectious virus just by breathing without coughing or sneezing. People with flu generate infectious particles, aerosols, tiny droplets, that stay suspended in the air for a long time, even when they are not coughing, and especially during the first days of illness. So when someone is coming down with influenza, they should go home and not remain in the workplace and infect others. So some pretty interesting news out of the University of Maryland. Okay, well, earlier this week, I uh, had a very interesting discussion with a friend of the show, Dr. Mike Osterholm, up there at SIDRAP at the University of Minnesota, and he recently had a New York Times op-ed published uh, entitled, We're Not Ready for a Flu Pandemic. So I had him on the show, on the podcast, and uh, to talk about the different key points in his article, and, um, you know, Osterholm saying, yeah, we are not prepared for a coming flu pandemic, which is going to happen at some point, history tells us. So let's go ahead and um, listen to what Dr. Osterholm has to say. So the question is, are we ready for a flu pandemic? Now, my guest today says, well, not so much, as he outlined in a New York Times op-ed earlier this week. Joining me now is Michael Osterholm, Ph.D., Dr. Osterholm is the director of SIDRAP at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Osterholm, welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so you titled the op-ed, We're Not Ready for a Flu Pandemic, and I'll link to it in the show notes if people want to check it out. Um, Dr. Osterholm, why are you so sure that a flu pandemic is in our near or our distant future? Well, first of all, influenza as an infectious agent goes back almost to antiquity. It uh, surely was around many, many thousands of years ago uh, in avian species birds and with some infection of mammals. Uh, but clearly, since we've had more modern history, meaning dating back uh, even a thousand years, influenza pandemics have occurred every so many uh, years, uh, sometimes uh, several decades, sometimes as frequently as once every 10 years. And if you go back through the history books, you can see that while we surely dealt with plague and we dealt with cholera and other kinds of outbreaks like that, uh, influenza pandemics were a part of that. And of course, that occurs when a new influenza virus makes its way out of the bird population, either through another animal species or to humans, and there's a sufficient number of genetic changes in the virus so that when a human actually becomes infected, the virus will actually enter their lung cells, and then more specifically, additional changes occur so that they then can transmit that virus to other humans. And it's when that new bird virus now is readily transmitted between people that we see a new pandemic emerge. Yeah, and in the, in the article, you focus a lot of attention on the issue of vaccines. Uh, so, Dr. Osterholm, where, how are we lacking and what needs to be done? Well, first of all, one has to understand the history of influenza vaccines, and we uh, actually provided a very detailed description of that in a report that our center at SIDRAP, the Center for Infectious Research and Policy, did uh, in 2011, where we actually uh, talked about uh, why influenza vaccines ever came to light. And it turns out that the uh, 1918 epidemic, the anniversary, of course, for 100 years this year, really weighed heavy on the minds of those who were fighting World War II. And uh, they remembered that, in fact, there were 10 times as many deaths 
1918, 1919 due to the pandemic flu than there was all the battlefield casualties combined. And so that at that point, they thought, what happens if we have another crowded environment kind of situation with war and what happens if another flu pandemic emerged? So at that time, uh, the Department of War in the United States was really the lead agency and put together a tremendous effort to try to come up with a vaccine that could be given to soldiers. And they hit upon what they thought were two very key antigens, the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. And remember, this is in the early days, really, of virology as such, and uh, developed this new vaccine. And for many, many years, people just assumed that that vaccine is developed and grown in chicken eggs was a highly effective vaccine. And in fact, our paper in 2009 in Lancet, which at the time was not a very popular paper, called that into question and said, based on our new analysis, if we look back at those old studies, they grossly overestimated how well these vaccines worked. And uh, at that point, then we understood that we did have problems. Today, it's a, a given people realize the the uh, problems with our current influenza vaccine and the fact that we need them. And, and unfortunately, uh, we, what I talked about in this op-ed piece in the New York Times was the fact that there really hasn't been the kind of investment in new influenza vaccine work that we desperately need to have effective vaccines, not just for seasonal flu, but also for a pandemic. So th- is this part of the reason you point to uh, the current Trump administration as part of the problem? Can you explain that? Yeah, well, first of all, let me take a step back and say it's not just the Trump administration. I mean, if you look back, we've not had a major initiative on influenza vaccines dating back decades. Now, recognizing that, in fact, it was really only in the 2009-10 time period that people began to understand the inferior performance of the current influenza vaccines. However, we did know, even before then, and it was true in 2009 with that the H1N1 pandemic, that the way we make influenza vaccines through largely growing it in chicken eggs, and it takes months to do that in each of the previous pandemics that occurred during the vaccine era, meaning 1957, 1968, and then subsequently in 2009, in each case, the pandemic had largely passed before the first doses of vaccine were ever available. And so uh, not only the question is, does it work, but could it be available? And so it was really around 2009 and 10 we began to understand the the nature of our challenges with influenza. But since that time, no government, including the United States, not just the United States, uh, no other organization, including the World Health Organization, others have really identified the critical need for what we call universal or new game-changing flu vaccines. And that's a real challenge for us because today it's going to take a Manhattan-like project. One of the things I commented on in our op-ed piece is this year the United States government, which is just one entity, I might add, not not mm-hmm. the only one that should be supporting this, is providing about $70 million in support for new universal flu vaccine research, whereas you know the world is putting in a billion dollars again this year for HIV vaccine research, which I think is very important, and it has been doing that for years. You know, why do we not put a similar investment into the flu vaccine area where we desperately need new flu vaccines? And there is some initial science that says we can actually find them. Now, the the next question I I found pretty troubling, and I would venture to guess that most of the public is not even aware of this. And you say that U.S. hospitals are woefully unprepared and supply shortages are a danger. Now, Dr. Osterholm, this is America. Why would we run out of supplies in a pandemic? Well, it's interesting you say that. Just this morning, I was reviewing the emergency medical systems uh, drug shortage list, which is a list kept by a group of EMS experts. And there are 54 drugs right now on sh- major shortage or absolutely not available lists. But the problem we have today is that the business of healthcare is just like business. And what I mean by that is today no one goes and gets an MBA at any kind of business school to talk about how to add more uh, complicated aspects to the supply chain. It's all about simplifying it. It's just in time delivery. Uh, we don't have warehouses anymore. They largely are on ships, uh, of anything, transporting goods from Asia to the United States. And so if you look, for example, today, most of the critical drugs that we use in this country actually are made in India and China. And there's, in most cases, no stockpiles of any kind. 
Uh, it's just in time delivery. And one of the points that we've made over and over again is in this kind of situation, um, you don't even need a major pandemic to have a problem. Look what's happening right now with, with sailing bags from Puerto Rico, which happened to be a place where most of the sailing bags in the world were made. One hurricane basically has caused major global shortages. Um, we can see around the country today, if you read the headlines, there are hospitals in California, elsewhere, that are just having major drug shortages because, again, the system of international production, international and global movement of those products is such that it's just in time delivery. So now put that on top of a overall preparedness for a pandemic where the whole world is going to be needing all these supplies at one time. And we're going to have major shortages. And that's why I have been critical, for example, of activities like the World Bank's activities to create a pandemic fund where at the time of the next influenza pandemic or global uh, situation like that, they're going to loan these company, uh, countries around the world that don't have the money, money to buy these goods. Well, there won't be any goods to buy. Um, in 2009, when the H1N1 pa- uh, pandemic occurred, uh, one of the major mask respirator companies in the world got over four years' worth of orders in one week for which they obviously were never going to fill the vast majority of those because they just didn't have the capacity. So one of the things we have to understand when we prepare for a pandemic is this global impact on manufacturing, trade, and travel. And that is going to overwhelm very quickly into the healthcare system in such a way that the collateral damage from a severe pandemic uh, could be every bit as bad as the actual infectious agent causing the pandemic like flu. And that's why we have to be better prepared uh, to not have that happen. Now, is anybody listening to these things that you're saying? I think a lot of people are listening. But, you know, I I look at, uh, for example, when the World Health Organization put together its very important R&D roadmap agenda for vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics, which now we have a series of very important infectious diseases for which we're trying to develop the criteria, the background, the reasons for why we need these vaccines and, and therapeutics and diagnostics, influenza was left off. Uh, when the Coalition of Preparedness Innovation, SIPI, came into being, influenza was left off. Um, you know, people have just made the assumption that somebody else is doing it. The private sector says it's the government's job. Government says, well, the private sector philanthropy has to do it. And part of the problem is no one is doing it. And I give credit to the NIH, uh, Tony Fauci and colleagues are surely making this a very important point from the standpoint of publicly identifying it as a critical issue. Yet when you look at the resources they have available to them today, $30 million roughly for this year. You know, when you look at the overall budget of the NIH, that's just a very, very, very small percentage of the the NIH budget. If this is really such a major and critical public health issue, why are we not investing much more into this? And to me, uh, that's that's a really major part of the message of our op-ed piece. We should be. Right. Now, lastly, um, what do you see? I don't want to scare the audience any more than I have, but... What do you what do you see as the worst case scenario? Well, you know, it's interesting, Robert, because as we've talked before in this program, you know, in our book, Deadliest Enemies, Our War Against Killer Germs, that Mark Holshaker and I published last year, we actually laid out a very detailed scenario of what an emerging influenza pandemic like one caused by H7N9, the current strain of you know, flu that we worry about in China, which is infecting humans from, from chickens. Fortunately, it has not yet been a virus that's changed enough so that humans transmit it to other humans. But about a third of the people who are being exposed to these bird viruses who become infected die. Uh, this is a very serious situation, and there's been a number of people who have tried to say to the world, wake up, this could be the next pandemic tomorrow. You know, the pandemic clock is ticking. We just don't know what time it is. And so I think that should one of these agents, uh, basic like H7 and 9, become the next pandemic strain of influenza, which there will be one, uh, this could be real, uh, a real catastrophic event. And, you know, we forget that in 1918, where 50 to a million people were killed by this virus, and at a time when the world is one-fourth the population it is today. Um, and the fact that they died largely not from secondary bacterial pneumonias, as has been reported by some, but we have increasing evidence that cytokine storms or immune system dysfunction was the primary reason for so many of the deaths. Uh, so that does, means that even having antibiotics today is not going to change that picture. Uh, this could be a really serious issue. And so I think that that's uh, what we're up against today. All right. Well, I want to encourage listeners to uh, also check out his book, uh, Dr. Osterholm's book, 
Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs, and I'll link to that in the show notes also. Um, Dr. Mike Osterholm, thanks again for your time and expertise. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, Robert. It's always great to do these with you, and I appreciate the public service you provide in doing this kind of work. Uh, You really are, uh, by yourself, uh, a very unique uh, gift to all of us from public health. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Take care of yourself, sir. Thank you. All right. So I guess um, something I wanted to talk about um, uh, the last time we met, and I know I'm a little late now, but I published a story on the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, which a lot of people did this. It's it's the end of year top 10 this, most important. Anyway, I did the 10 most important infectious disease stories of 2017 based on my opinion on the observations I made during the course of the year. You may not agree, but this is uh, what I came up with. And drum roll, please. Number 10 was we're getting ever closer to eradication of polio and guinea worm disease. Now, of course, we know that smallpox is the first and only human infectious disease that's been eradicated, and that was you know, decades ago. But uh, it's incredible what we've seen with polio. It's decreased by 99% since 1988. Back then, there was like 350,000 cases. How many cases were there in 2017? 21. And uh, we can give a lot of thanks to uh, the hard workers and the vaccinations for that. And guinea worm disease is a parasitic disease. And... um. I think they only had about 20, a couple dozen cases um, last year. So the work of the Carter Center and the like are doing wonderful stuff over in Africa to eliminate this parasitic disease. Uh, Number nine, I had the measles outbreak in Europe, which has been going on since late 2016. And they've had, you know, 14, 15,000 cases and a lot like in Romania and Italy and Germany and uh, a lot of problems with people not being vaccinated. So I put that at number nine. <clears throat> number eight was a lot of Lyme disease developments during the course of the year. We got the tick-borne uh, disease working group that's going on with the HHS. We got a, a Lyme vaccine that's right now FDA, uh, got FDA fast-track designation. And we have that wonderful study um, about uh, the Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria surviving a 28-day course of antibiotics when treated months after infection. So interesting uh, stuff coming out of the world of Lyme disease. Number seven, the Dengvaxia debacle in the Philippines. Uh, you know, uh, Sanofi Pasteur put out the first ever dengue vaccine, and the Philippines was the second country to approve it and they went full bore with vaccinating about 800,000 people uh, kids and uh, then you know last November there was it was revealed that the vaccine uh, caused an increased risk of severe dengue and hospitalization several years after vaccination among people in all age groups who have not been exposed to dengue prior to vaccination so they pulled all the uh, vaccines and the the Philippines uh, asked Snowfi to pick up the stuff that wasn't used. And it's, this is a thing that's still going on during the course of uh, 2018. Uh, big out, Number six, big outbreaks of meningococcal meningitis in the African meningitis belt. Uh, Nigeria, Niger, Burkina Faso, all these countries saw large, large um, epidemics of meningitis. Uh, number five, we saw some really large hepatitis A outbreaks here and in Europe, um, particularly uh, a lot reported among men who have sex with men and homeless people. Uh, number four, the WHO put out that report about uh, we're running out of antibiotics, so that caused a lot of stir, and it is a pretty uh, frightening stuff. Number three I put down is Venezuela, and no matter how you turn this one around, um, the, the stuff that's going on in Venezuela in every aspect of their life has been disastrous and infectious disease is one of them and besides malaria upticks in measles and of course diphtheria um number two the well publicized this year um madagascar plague outbreak where there was 
about 2,500 cases and 200 deaths. And it was primarily um, a pneumonic plague, which is kind of unusual. And number one, I call the Yemen crisis, and that's just pure chaos over there. And that's really led to over a million cholera cases in what about seven or eight months, which is clearly a record. And now they're battling diphtheria in a major way. So um, that's what I got for my top 10. Okay. I'm glad you listened today. I appreciate it. Go to the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Check out the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spotify. And I will see you next week on Outbreak News This Week. Good night. God bless. Thank you for listening to Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. If you missed any part of today's program, you can listen to the podcast anytime on our website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Make sure to join us here next week for Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman.